Good morning. Today I'll be speaking about the MQTT message bus. It's very big in IoT, but it's not just for IoT. So MQTT is a featherweight ISO-compliant PubSub messaging protocol. And actually, um, it's very good for chat also. If you want to go to forestwiki.com, you can chat during this presentation about this presentation. Forestwiki.com. So here's the basic idea. You have a broker, and inside the broker there's some topics, and you have some clients who, who connect to the broker, and they can either subscribe to a topic, there's a tree of topics, or they can publish to a topic. So in this case, on the left-hand side, we have a publisher, he sends a message to a topic, and it gets re resent to the people who have subscribed to those topics. So there's a lot of technical detail about how it does quality of service. It has three different quality of service levels messages. So even if it's disconnected, the message will go through. Quality of level zero is best effort. Quality of service level one is guaranteed at least once delivery. And quality of service level two is um, guaranteed exactly once delivery. And this is how it's implemented, if you're curious. But it just works. So a lot of people, when they want to connect two machines, their first choice is HTTP, but MQTT is much more efficient than HTTP. So if I want to send just a temperature reading across the network, I can just send a, you know, a couple bytes of what the temperature is, a byte of what the temperature is. In HTTP, you've got the headers, um, and it's, it's got to pack everything up and, and unpack everything, and also um, you know, it loads in other files. HTTP is way more complex. It's a different use case. Um, HTTP doesn't like connections that aren't there. OK, so why do you want to do PubSub? Well, I mean, you could just have the IP address or domain name of every client that you want to talk to, but that's way too complex. So you just need to know who the server is and what the topic is. It's a much conceptually simpler for the developers for management. Um, and so, it <clears throat> so the publishers and subscribers do not need to know each other. Also in time, publishers and subscribers do not have to be online at the same time. So say you have a refrigerator truck and you need to send it instructions as to what temperature to set. Um, the refrigerator truck can be in a tunnel, but when it comes out of the tunnel, it'll get that message or it can report back what the temperature is when it gets out of the tunnel. It doesn't care if it's temporarily disconnected. And finally, you have some publishers and subscribers that operate at different, different speeds, some very small devices, very fast devices. So it, it connects those very happily. It also has something called retained messages. So you have a tree of topics. And in any topic, when you publish a message, you can say, please keep this value. So if I'm a temperature sensor and I wake up every hour, I publish a message, the broker, I can say, please retain this message, and the broker will keep that value. And it's a tree of topics. So if you have, um, for a weather um, tower, you may have several different values that it reads. Each one can be in their own subtopic, or you can do a JSON value. And many of the brokers are persistent. So if the broker crashes, if you reboot the broker, those retained values are, are persisted. So it's like a key value tree and key value database. On the other hand, maybe the device is broken. So as a sensor, I can say, listen, I'm going to log in once an hour. If you don't hear from me in an hour, that means I'm dead. Please tell the world. And that means publish the following message on the following topic. And then whoever cares can do what they need to do. And so ever since, what, 2014 on Google Trends, it's been taking off. Uh, maybe that's when the whole IoT thing started. And it's very widely used. So all the big names now include MQTT, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, IBM Watson. Of course, it originated in IBM. But also very small people use it. So there's a ton of people doing home automation um, with it, a few small devices connected to the network. So most people like it because of the protocol. But what I find very interesting is this hierarchy. So it drives me nuts that on Google or Twitter or YouTube, you have these infinite lists. A basic principle in human factors is that there should be no more than about seven items in a category. 
And so you end up with trees, taxonomies, and MQTT supports that very nicely. So we'll actually, it started in the oil industry, so I'll use an example from the oil industry. I feel a bit bad because the oil industry is causing this huge climate crisis, but forgive me, that's history. So you can imagine that you may have an oil field with multiple wells pumping, and there may be sensors. So you can imagine a tree where there's a branch for every um, oil well, and there are a couple of sensors on every oil well. Or maybe multiple fields, and you can have a much larger tree covering a large geographical area. MQTT actually originated in the oil industry. So in Saudi Arabia, they had these very long pipelines through the desert, and IBM came in and consulted for them. And so each pipeline was a separate branch of the tree, and then you have pumping stations with sensors, so each, each uh, pumping station was a different branch, and then every sensor within, within that. And the satellites would only go over like once a day, and so it was perfectly fine dealing with that kind of intermittent connectivity. So 1990, this is where MQTT came from. And in a much more modern version, you can imagine a bunch of weather satellites, maybe on the, the right-hand side, uh, weather towers, um, collecting a bunch of sensors, a different tree, connecting over some wireless connectivity. And on the left-hand side, you can imagine a geographical tree. Here we have France, Poland, Germany, within different cities, different regions. So for managing complexity, MQT is just brilliant. And of course, the big one is organizations. So, you know, organizations have org charts, and so many of them use uh, Slack for chat, but chat, Slack just gives you a list of channels. Maybe it gives you um, a thread within that, but it's tricky to use. You really want every um, group in an organization to have their own chat room. So MQTT works great for that because it just makes a tree of chat rooms just it's kind of trivial. Um, so I, in fact, actually had built a forest chat wiki um, Slack and Discord, they're not trees and they're not wikis. And uh, Wikimedia, it's a tree. It's not a tree and it does not do chat. So if I can switch here to... Um, so here we have the, the Go Days. This is the, the wiki piece. Here we have the Go Days Berlin and then there are different chat rooms for each of the uh, different talks. Um, and you can scroll through it. So it's a much bigger tree you can scroll through. And if we go back, we can see... Um, you can click on chat and you can, um, you can chat in, in these rooms, but, okay, just do this quick. Oh, and I also have to show you while I'm here, um, what people really love are my Golang videos. So here are the best Golang lightning talks, and the problem is if you go to YouTube, they don't have a description. So here if you click um, on golangvideos.com, you can see some of these videos and you see the description. If you don't want to watch them, it just takes a moment really fast. People like that. But back to the talk. Sorry. Okay, so there's some examples. Trees. Okay, so, so what about the, what does the API look like? Um, so there, uh, <clears throat> this is the Go language. The basic, you may connect to multiple different brokers. So first you create a data class, a client class, using the new client. And there are a bunch of options. You have to tell it, um, what the, domain, what the domain or the IP is. <clears throat> you have to tell it um, what the port number is. You may have passwords. Um, there are a couple other options you can fill in there. And then you connect to it. Uh, maybe wait a few seconds to make sure it actually connects. In different languages, the, the connect is done slightly differently. And then you publish, this, um, you publish a message to it. So you have to tell it which topic to publish, um, what quality of service, zero, one, or two, uh, whether to, to retain the message or not, and then you have to send it the message. And of course, people have to subscribe to it. Uh, topic, quality of service, and the callback function to execute. So I only have 15 minutes, so I'm not going to go in the code very much. But um, I really like Cloud MQTT. They make it so easy to get started. They give you a free broker. It's the Mosquito, which is the one that IBM open sourced. They give you a free broker, you get five clients for free, and they've got, um, they, make a, they just have a, a Git repository for each language. Uh, you do a Git clone, you type in a couple of commands, and, and you're connected. It's just brilliant. They, uh, it's so user friendly. I really, really like that. Um, and of course, that works great. They've got user interfaces, you don't have to mess with the command line. But at a certain point, you're going to find that they don't have a certain option, right? And so then, if you're still using Mosquito, 
Um, what I did is I released a container. It's on Docker Hub. <clears throat> let's encrypt dash mosquito. You have to type in exactly let's encrypt dash mosquito. And it does the whole, um, the whole uh, uh, let's encrypt cert bot stuff for you. It actually uses the cat Golang Caddy web server. Um, Nginx just became the leading web server, but Caddy's brilliant. Really impressive piece of work. OK, so how fast are these? Um, typically, you can send about 100,000 messages a second through the broker. Um, this, these numbers are better, slower, smaller. Um, I just grabbed this graph to give you, because um, it had pretty graphics. But, and the different brokers have different performance. And if you really have to scale, there are a couple that will scale across multiple servers. And of course, the biggest one is Facebook. So the whole Facebook Messenger is based on MQTT. So it's going to scale as, as, as high as you want to. Um, MQTT is a standard. I'd never heard of Oasis, but ISO is a, a well-known standards body. And the reason that that's so important um, is that it means that there are a lot of brokers. So a lot of people um, start with a free one, test.mosquito.org. There are a bunch of these online brokers. Um, all, the, um, all the major hosting companies have them. <clears throat> There's some scalable brokers. Akamai has a very interested distributed broker. You can also choose the broker based on whatever language you want. Um, and there are uh, client libraries that run on every single platform imaginable. OK, so the important one is the Golang brokers. Emitter.io has the most contributors. I actually used Emitter.io. It's got some strange things on how it does permissions. It puts your credentials in the top of the publish subscribe tree, but it's good. OK, so to wrap up, MQT is an efficient, reliable, scalable, Industry standard machine to machine pub sub messaging protocol with three different quality of service levels, topics, a tree of topics, retained messages, and last wills and testaments. A couple of links. Awesome MQT is a list of really good curated websites. It includes Mosquito Go Off, so the Mosquito Broker for custom uh, authentications that's actually written in it's a plugin, and all of that is actually included in the Let's Encrypt Mosquito that I released on Docker Hub. Um, the, a chat wiki, you can get an MQTT chat wiki on the Docker Hub. MQTT Explorer is a web GUI. Sorry, it's a desktop GUI, so you can test your brokers. And then Paho libraries are all available. OK, so you can contact me if you go to golangvideos.com. That's kind of fun. At MQTT class on Twitter, pythonlinks.info, 1,500 videos there. Each one has their own chat room. And uh, forestwiki.com are my websites. And maybe I have a minute or two left if people want to ask me a question. I can't see here, so speak up if you're doing a question. Go ahead. Uh, first, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so as far as I understood, initially this MQTT protocol was designed for um, like slow connections, um, radio relays, uh, for example. Is there a way to acknowledge the delivery of the message? I mean that the messages are delivered uh, from publisher to the broker and not uh, lost somewhere in the way. So um, here's how the messages go. And there's a whole protocol, depending upon which level of service, where it confirms whether the messages have been delivered or not. So the quality of service is zero. It does its best effort to connect. One, it guarantees that it connects. And quality of service. Two, it guarantees that it only gets delivered once. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's basically because the slides were like very fast. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's OK. I made a photo of it. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. So I wanted to ask if one of the requirements are the, like a static ID, as from what you saw, uh, from what you talked. Um, that the client and the server has to kind of con communicate, and is it a requirement of static ID, uh, I IP, I mean? Oh, excellent ex ex question. Because for the home automation place, people have dynamic IPs. So there are these things called dynamic DNS. And what's really one of the things that's brilliant about the Caddy web server written in Golang is it supports that whole dynamic DNS, and MQTT will run over web sockets. And so actually, my Docker container doesn't actually currently do the dynamic DNS, but if you want to do it, I'll certainly install that for you. But yeah, so MQT isn't going to do the dynamic DNS. But, um, and then the way dynamic DNS works is your IP address changes 
but there's a connection to the broker, to the um, dynamic DNS um, provider, and they will change their DNS, um, the IP address in your DNS file whenever your changes because you run a little script on your computer. So, so very good question. There is a solution to that. And it's really, it's essential for the home automation stuff. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, one question. Um, so this sounds all uh, really great. So uh, can you name a few scenarios where you would use uh, rather HTTPS or, or HTTP instead of MQTT? Well, certainly for documents, OK? I mean, as soon as you're doing documents, then a human is there. But if you have an application on a cell phone that's just sending data, then MQTT will do better. And the other thing is um, publish, subscribe, right? So if you only have a single server and no one is subscribing, don't mess with MQTT. Do something simpler. But it's really essential. Actually, they had the games talk yesterday, where he has um, a tank game, and there's a simulator on every machine. And so I could imagine that you could publish an MQTT message, and all the tanks that are in the vicinity would get it, and their simulators would update. So, um, so it's essential that there be multiple subscribers. If you only have one server, don't mess. If you're, if you're doing documents, don't mess. Okay. Great question. Thank you. All great questions. Um, he asked about end-to-end -end encryption. So what happens when you do let's encrypt, I know who the server is and my traffic to the server is encrypted, but the problem is how does the server know who I am? So the other piece that a lot of people do are self-signed certificates and they exchange them. Um, so, so you may want to do that. And of course, you can also just encrypt your, instead of sending a text message or a JSON message, you can encrypt your message if you want to do even more. He, his, the question was, is there end-to-end -end encryption in case it's not recorded in the video? Oh, I also should say, I actually teach MQTT classes, so that's another thing I do. It's kind of fun. Really smart guys show up for it. Anyhow, is my time up? Do we have any more questions? Okay. Thank you. <laughs>